I would like to welcome you today to Tomra's webcast, Rethinking the Waste Problem. My name is Claudia Fassel and I would like to invite you to navigate through our agenda. Dr. Volker Rehrmann, Head of Circular Economy Tomra, will talk about his visions, expectations for the circular economy 2030. His conclusion is the time for discussing and debating is over. And with a warm welcome, I would like to introduce Dr. Dominic Hock to you, Chairman of Hinomia Research and Consulting, the independent consultancy for sustainability from the UK. So, to begin with, both speakers will present their conclusions to you, followed by discussion, and then we will open up the meeting for Q&A and any further questions you may have. Please use the chat function to give us a sign afterwards. For transparency reasons, the session is being recorded. And one more thing. In fact, in a recent survey commissioned by Tomra and carried out by Future Management Group, over 70 industry experts were asked what they thought uh, cir Circular Economy 2030 could look like in both industrial and developing regions. The findings to survey can be found in a new white paper, Resource Recovery Playbook, that you can see here, along with ambitious ideas for the way out into a sustainable future. You can download your free copy and either one of, uh, on either one of the websites indicated on the site. But now to start the discussion, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Volker Rehrmann from Tomra. He's the executive vice president of the company, which is the world leader in reverse vending and waste sorting machines. Dr. Rehrmann is an experienced and respected industry pioneer for appropriate measures and technique with insights in local waste markets. Dr. Rehrmann, two questions for you as a starter. How has Corona added to the worsening level of waste? What is the link to COVID-19? Thank you, Claudia, and uh, good morning to everybody out there. Thanks for uh, for joining in to our uh, webcast uh, this morning. And to answer your question there, you know, we see basically two effects uh, from the Corona pandemic currently on the waste management and, and recycling industry. One is, is a very obvious one. We see a boost of waste in households currently because of the pandemic restriction, the lockdown. And it's no surprise because we are spending much more time at home now, like probably you today and, and, and us, you know, spending time in our home office instead uh, of, of our normal place in, in the office. Restaurants are closed, movie theaters are closed. So basically we're staying much more at home and consuming much more at home. So there is a significant um, higher amount of uh, um, household waste, especially packaging waste, plastic uh, packaging waste. And I think we also learn, uh, despite the general bashing of plastics, uh, we learn a little bit about the general benefits of plastic that we now also appreciate in these difficult times because of you know, the hygienic benefits uh, plastics has, the protection of food, longer shelf life of food. So they are, they are generally also you know, uh, nice properties of plastics that we now value much more in, in these difficult times. But there's also a second effect uh, in, in the market, which is really disastrous uh, for uh, the recycling industry uh, right now. Because, because, because of the economic crisis, there's generally a significantly lower demand for materials in, in, in general. And that results in, in low prices uh, for materials. And also oil prices are, are very low. And the combined effect of low oil prices and the low demand for, for materials, for plastics in general, leads to very low prices for virgin materials. So recycled plastics, for example, and also many other recycling materials cannot compete on prices anymore with virgin materials. So the recycling industry is suffering badly. And we see currently you know, slow investments in the, in the recycling industry, in the metal recycling industry, in particular plastics recycling industry, even though what we need right now is the opposite. We would need significant investments into infrastructure if we want to reach uh, the, the targets that are given to us here in Europe by, uh, by, by legislation. 
But there's also one sign of hope, and that is PET, bottle-to-bottle recycling. Driven by legislation and consumer pressure, all big beverage producers have given commitments to increase the amount of recycled content in their PT bottles significantly. And they have stayed loyal to their commitments. Even though right now, the prices for recycled PT, high quality recycled PT are significantly higher than for virgin PT. So if they wanted to go easy and save costs, they would just buy virgin PT instead of recycled PT. But they are not doing that and they are staying loyal even in these difficult times to their commitments and this is i, I have never experienced before in in the recycling industry yeah that's great to hear but the urgent need for an effective waste management is still pressing is even more pressing what is a viable solution in your mind Yes, the viable solution is, of course, a very complex question. And if, if, if I start a little bit earlier, the world is currently facing two very heavy environmental pressures. It's climate change and ocean plastic pollutions. And both are incredible complex challenges. But it is well known and it is generally accepted that the transitioning to a circular economy can play a significant role in solving, uh, at least partly, those two pressures. The key question for everybody is, how do we get there? And specifically for us at Tomra, we ask ourselves the question, you know, which role can we play as Tomra? And which role in general does waste management and recycling play uh, to solve these uh, environmental uh, pressures? And if you take a look at the waste hierarchy, it's, there's no doubt that the greatest environmental benefits will come from preventing waste to start with and from more reuse models. However, we see that the efforts in these areas are really slow. They require su systemic change and it's often not easy to replace um, uh, material. And sometimes uh, it, it does also not improve the ecological footprint. Uh, so while it so, is true... So these are long-term long targets, right? These are definitely long-term targets. We don't see a lot of that happening uh, right now. To make it very clear, we need to reduce. Sometimes, we, you know, it's ridiculous what how we pack material. So there is there is you know a, a big benefit in re, uh, um, reducing material uh, and also turning to uh, to more reuse models. But it's not always time, and it, it will take long time. And we are convinced that we can already act now if we focus more on the recycling uh, part of it, using well designed and properly implemented holistic waste management systems. Um, and using these mostly proven and existing um, solutions, savings in greenhouse gas emissions can be achieved that you know, are equivalent to grounding all commercial flights and taking 60% of all cars globally off the road. So significant, as we will learn later uh, by, by Unomir's uh, study. Well, that, that would be impressive, right? Yes, so the role of waste management and, and, and recycling industry can be significant here, but there is a need to act now. And that's why we as Tomra have decided to invest into the green future with the establishment of our new circular economy division. Within this division, we focus on holistic system solutions that go well beyond our typical product focus. So we're not only selling a product, we are really trying to develop solutions that are holistic and, and are, are thought through from A to Z. And as we will hear from Dominic later today, these holistic system solutions have the potential to reduce global CO2 emissions by a significant amount, by up to 2 billion tons. On top of that, they will properly help getting a hold on the environmental litter problem. But we are totally aware that this is a complex challenge. And, uh, and, and because we want to make a real impact, we have decided that we will at first focus on the problem of plastics packaging. You can ask why plastics packaging? Well, closed loop recycling works reasonably well today, at least in the developed countries, for several groups of materials. They are reasonably well functioning systems for paper, glass, metals, aluminum, bio waste, still not perfect still a way to go, but compared to plastic, they are already very good. But for plastics packaging, we have a very dysfunctional systems. Even after several decades of efforts in plastics recycling, it is fundamentally not working. According to a study 
from McKinsey uh, that they made for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the problem has fundamentally two sides. First of all, the amount of plastic that is collected to be made available for a recycling process is very low. It is globally currently at 14.14%. This means the majority of all plastics, despite our you know, 30 years of, of, of working on this, is still lost to incineration and, and to landfills. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you know, once you have collected the material, you need to make something out of it. So the recycling process as such is also not working, uh, working well. The majority of the material is downcycled and there's simply not enough demand for low quality, uh, quality materials. So these two areas need to be addressed. And that's what we are working on in the, in the circular economy team. And we have given the commitment that we are striving for a world where by 2030, instead of 14, 40% 40 of post-consumer plastics packaging is collected for recycling globally. And, you know, just to be very clear, technically this can be solved already today, which we will also show, show later. It's not the technical uh, problem. And secondly, we commit that we will work on, you know, solutions for the recycling process to bring recycled, uh, collected plastics in the recycling process to a quality level that it can really replace virgin materials so that we can see 30% of the post-consumer plastic packaging being in a, in a closed loop. These are the two fundamental areas that we will focus on in, in the beginning and uh, where we you know, have given a clear commitments from our side. Yes, but, uh, but I think you can't do that alone, right? Absolutely. We cannot do this alone. We want and we need to engage everyone in the value chain to accelerate um, uh, the transformation, the transition to a circular economy. And indeed, we are now working within the circular economy team with various partners from the value chain that have never been customers of Tomra. You know, we are discussing and, and uh, you know, uh, solutions with chemical companies, virgin producers of plastic. We're, you know, talking to converters, a lot to brand owners, uh, trying to, you know, convince them to use more recycled content in their products, trying to show them what is possible, what can be done. And we get a lot of feedback, positive feedback uh, from, from the various players. Um, and that's also why we have initiated a new movement the re-society with the goal of becoming a hub for the circular economy. We invite everybody to join this lively and productive movement. Industry, legislative bodies, startups, schools, universities, consumers, and basically everyone who can and wants to support this transition. Thank you very much, Dr. Rehmann, so far. There was an important voice a few weeks ago. The European Court of Auditors warned without new efforts in treating plastic waste, it will be impossible to achieve climate goals in 2030. So I would like to hand over now to our special guest, Dr. Dominic Hock, Chairman of Unomia Research and Consulting. Dr. Hock will present you with an overall view of needs to achieve climate goals. Firstly, Dr. Hock founded Unomia in 2001. He has led a number of major strategy and policy projects related to waste management for the EU institutions that have had a major influence on European <coughs> circular economy policy and regulation. And his experience is in high demand globally from North America to many parts of the developing world. Over to you now, Dr. Hock, to discuss your results, please. Many thanks, Claudia, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us this morning and thanks to Tomra for allowing me to present today. Um, the subject of how the management of waste can help us in combating climate change is a subject that's extremely close to our hearts here at Unomia and it's a subject we've been working on ever since we, we started. And uh, back in 2015, in the, in the margins of the Paris Climate Conference, we launched a paper then about how we felt that uh, waste management could contribute to climate change objectives. Now, what we've done uh, in this work for Tomra is we've looked at um, 
And some of the data available around global waste management generation, um, particularly around municipal waste, to understand what's the magnitude of the opportunity if we actually manage waste better than we currently do. And in ways, frankly, which we know we can do now, nothing fancy, nothing terribly sophisticated, things that we know are within our grasp if we arrange these systems well. And as uh, Volker hinted at there, we, we've described these as holistic system solutions, and we'll, we're, we're looking to develop those in different parts of the world as, as we go forward with Tomra. And this, this uh, quantity of municipal waste is enormous. Um, the World Bank, in, uh, in its work back in 2016, estimated, uh, sorry, it was uh, 2018, but the data was for 2016. It was estimating that global municipal waste generation was 2.02 billion tonnes. Now, as a management problem, that's a volume of material that's roughly equal to trying to manage 10,000 Empire State buildings of waste every year. It's a huge management problem. Some of that, of course, is currently not even collected. And wherever waste is not being collected, that's uh, where it becomes a significant, that there, there is significant potential for waste to be disposed of into rivers and into seas, creating this problem of ocean plastic pollution. And when we look at what, uh, what, what climate change emissions are involved in making stuff, then if we look at this next slide, um, you'll see that from a couple of studies here, one, the International Resource Panel of, of UNEP, um, which was highlighting the fact that around 23% of global greenhouse gas emissions were linked to making these materials the metals, the cement and so forth, plastics and rubber and wood. Whereas another 26% were accounted for in uh, producing, harvesting, distributing and retailing food. So around 49% of all global greenhouse gas emissions are associated with making stuff. And it's that stuff, of course, that we're consuming that subsequently becomes waste. And if we look at that uh, quantity of municipal waste that the World Bank is estimating will grow to 2.59 billion tonnes in 2030, then <laughs> if we go to the next slide, we'll see that the, um, the emissions associated with making those materials that subsequently become waste, and this is every year, are somewhere between 4.4 and 5.7 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent today. That's around 10% of all global greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. to rising to something like, if we don't do anything about it, between 5.6 and 7.3 billion tonnes by 2030. Now, bear in mind that if we're on track to respect the limits of a sort of 1.5 degree warming trajectory, then by 2030, we're going to have to have done something like halve global greenhouse gas emissions. So if that isn't being translated into the, uh, the way in which we're producing the stuff that becomes waste, then at that point in time, we're talking about something like 20, 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions coming from the stuff that we produce that we just put into the bin every year. That's incredible and it's an incredible opportunity. And to, on top of that, if we look at what is currently reported to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change regarding emissions under the waste chapter, you'll see at the moment there's something like 1.6 billion tonnes associated with managing that material. And that's only the emissions associated with landfilling, a lot of that, uh, probably more than 600 million of it, is associated with wastewater treatment. And so um, we've got some additional emissions associated with the management of that material. The UNFCC reporting, FCCC reporting system is not entirely helpful in that it masks the benefits of what happens when we recycle material. Because we know that one of the things that happens when we recycle material is we use less energy in making those materials and so we're generating fewer emissions and actually 
That doesn't appear in the waste chapter when we're reporting to the UN. It appears in the industry chapter or the energy chapter as the reduced uh, level of emissions from those sectors. But the key point is that the stuff that we're throwing away embodies within it this huge amount of uh, climate change emissions mm -hmm. that is set to grow over time. So what can we do to manage that better? What can we do to improve the impact of what is happening? What this graphic shows is it, to, it, is it looked at what are, the, what are the level of greenhouse gas emissions associated with managing waste in the way it's currently managed in 2030? And if we just stay as we are and we generate as much waste as the World Bank is suggesting we will be in 2030, and frankly, let's hope we don't. Um, but if we do, um, then the difference between that baseline situation and good practice is 1.58 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent saved. That's huge. That's 3% of all global greenhouse gas emissions today. And it's by doing things that we know we can do. And things that are popular with residents, with governments. This is a problem that people want to deal with. It creates a problem of ocean plastic pollution also, because some of these emissions are associated with the mismanagement of waste. The, the material being dumped in the open, some of it being burnt. Now, if we look at uh, an, another projection on the next slide, we actually think the World Bank has somewhat underestimated the quantity of waste that there is actually being produced today. Um, so that one of the reasons we have for, for uh, believing that is that we've looked very closely ourselves at the data um, that are reported by European countries to Eurostat, for example, that's called municipal waste, but we know actually that that's not all of municipal waste. The figures are around 30% too low. We know that when we look at the World Bank data, the figure for Canada only includes the residual waste. It's about 30% too low. We know that when you look at the data for China, the, the per capita waste generation figures look suspiciously low, being similar to some low income countries such as Togo. So. You, you, you sort of struggle to believe some of the figures and it's not perhaps surprising given the fact that some of this waste isn't even being managed at the moment. So we have, we think, a much greater problem there in the first place. And if we're right in that, then with that greater quantity that we think is being generated, actually the magnitude of that opportunity increases. Of course, it increases the size of the initial problem but actually managing that material better would actually lead to a saving of 2.17 billion tonnes, which as Volker said, is equivalent to grounding all aircraft across the world and taking uh, two thirds of all cars off the road tomorrow. It's an incredible opportunity. So in summary, this magnitude of change in the face of the global threat that we're confronted with called climate change, we can't really ignore this. And I think we've underplayed the significance of this in the past. And so by ensuring that we're managing waste better, that we're keeping materials within the cycle of productive use through better recycling of those materials, more uh, better managing of all of the waste materials that are out there, that we can actually contribute significantly to this massive global problem of climate change. And at the same time, because in order to do this, we've actually got to collect the waste in the first place, then we'll actually have dealt with, to a substantial degree, this massive problem of ocean plastics that Volker also alluded to. And depending upon what you read, that's around eight to 12 million tonnes of uh, plastic going into the ocean each year. And by the way, virtually all of those studies are based on the existing World Bank data, which as I say, we believe may be understating the quantity of waste out there. So, you know, the opportunity is huge and we need to seize it and we need to seize it urgently because we need to, to try to prevent the world going into a situation where we're facing catastrophic climate change in the future. 
Thank you very much. The challenge is huge and the answer Tomra believes is holistic as we learned already. There is a significant untapped potential in reusing the good materials. But now the question is how to do it. How is the key question? We would like to briefly outline a life case study in a region called Stavanger in Norway. You are both familiar with that case, but will you begin, Dr. Rehman, to start to explain that to, to us, that example? Yes, uh, sure. Thank you, uh, Claudia. Yes, Stavanger is an interesting case, but uh, referring to Unomio's star study, what Dominic just showed, I mean, we see it's a, it's a significant op opportunity out there if all countries would apply good practice as for simplicity reasons Dominique called it. The question now is what is good practice and, and got, that is what we're trying to study. What is a good practice system that uh, based on currently existing solutions or let's say close to uh, solutions out there to make this available. So we looked around for certain regions you know as a world market leader we, we, we are um, doing business and uh, delivering solutions to many places in the world and, and we see those places that work well and those places that, that don't work so well. So we have identified Stavanger in Norway as, as, a, as a very interesting uh, region, the concept they, they have started there. And the history is a few years ago, <laughs> we were approached by, by, by the municipality of Stavanger uh, with the ambition to significantly increase their, their recycling level because they have realized they had realized that there was still a significant amount of recyclables unrecovered in the residual household waste. And at that time, we had for the first time developed a, a, a sorting plant that, it, that was able to sort mixed household waste in very high quality. So together then we designed and built one of the most advanced sorting plants for residual waste in the world. And by doing that, they significantly increased the collection rate of various materials, in particular plastics. Uh, and you wouldn't believe it, the amount of plastics recovered per capita quadrupled compared to the previous system of, of the separate collection system for, for plastics packaging. And because, you know, we see that there are uh, already various good elements of what we think is, is a good practice waste management system in place in, in Stavanger, uh, you know, and, and, and you can see on this slide what we mean there. In, in Stavanger, they have a beverage container deposit return scheme, the, which leads to a very high uh, collection rate uh, for, for beverage bottles. They have separate collection systems for glass, metal, paper, food and, 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 and garden waste. Uh, please show, show the slide here that already shows um, uh, the, the various elements uh, of, of the system. And uh, it's still not perfect, but we think a lot of, uh, of, of the fundamental uh, building blocks, elements that should be part of it, are implemented there and together with the latest step of, of the mixed waste sorting. And also they build a washing line down there to, to, to recycle the, the recovered plastics out there at the same place, at the same site. We thought it was interesting to really study what are the results, what can we achieve with this type of system as a kind of role model. And as I said, it's still not uh, not perfect. And we asked Unomia to do an, as an independent body to study, you know, how does it work there? Where are potential improvements to get really to a, a, a very good waste management <coughs> system that is close to what we would consider in, in, in the study as a, a best practice um, uh, system. Dr. Hock, can you explain that? What, what your results are regarding Stavanger? Well, it, it's been extremely interesting and we've uh, had uh, great uh, fun uh, interrogating each other and, and liaising with the, the uh, very helpful um, uh, team in Stavanger to uh, understand exactly what's happening in the system. And what we were trying, what we started by doing, and it's not just Stavanger we're looking at, but um, was trying to understand well, what would be the key aspect, that the key indicators of a good municipal waste management system, because actually, um, you know, we tend to look at recycling rates as one indicator, but what are, what are the other indicators we should use? One of the indicators we think is an interesting one, the greenhouse gas weighted recycling rate. So what, what we've done is we've essentially said, well, okay, 
if everything in the waste stream was recycled at 100%, what would be the savings we would get in terms of greenhouse gases? And, and then compare that with what the system actually achieves and give attribute the percentage of that uh, maximum benefit to the system. So it's a sort of greenhouse gas performance recycling rate. We, we've got other indicators as well that we've looked at. But this system, uh, it, 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 is, it is really important that we look at waste in this holistic way and that we, we see how all of these bits fit together. And you see in Stavanger, we have uh, the, um, from the flow diagram here, we have a deposit collection system. And you can see it doesn't collect a huge amount of material, but when what you'll see in, the, in later slides is that um, the contribution that makes to the carbon, the greenhouse gas performance of the system is disproportionately high. Similarly, container parks or civic community sites, as we sometimes call them in the UK, or household waste recycling centres, very important to collect those things, sometimes the bulky items, waste electrical equipment, things that aren't necessarily generated day in, day out by households, but where um, it's possible to, to make sure that things are well separated out and are uh, made available either for reuse or for recycling. Um, then the separate collection systems, both for the dry materials and the organics, and then the mixed waste sorting system. And as Volker alluded to, it's very interesting what's happening with those facilities at the moment, because what we've seen in Stavanger is that where for the plastics that the facility is targeting, the capture rate is extremely high. So for example, poly uh, polyethylene films get captured to the tune of something like 75 to 80% as far as we can see. Now, the facility currently doesn't target certain polymers and, uh, and types of product. Why? Well, because there isn't necessarily a viable market for them. And, and what would they do? They'd sort it out and send it to, in, to a, an energy from waste plant, perhaps. And given that the, the, the residual waste, get, waste is going to an energy from waste plant anyway, then why would you necessarily sort it out only to then recombine it with what you were sending there? Mm -hmm. So that's where the interesting evolution is going to happen in the future as the uh, brands start to bring forward more recyclable fractions and so forth. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that in the current situation, in the baseline situation, Stavanger's recycling rate as conventionally measured is around 51%. Um, if you look on the right hand side, the baseline on the greenhouse gas recycling rate is actually 67.3% uh, because actually Stavanger is doing fairly well at targeting those materials that deliver significant greenhouse gas benefits. We then looked at, well, how difficult would it be to get to 65%, which is the EU municipal waste recycling rate target for the future, and how, and we set the objective for all municipalities to, to as our indicator, to get to 75% of the available greenhouse gas savings from recycling. And it turns out that through relatively uh, straightforward changes um, that we know can be achieved, both in the separate collection service and also in the uh, mixed waste sorting uh, system, we can actually achieve that 75% greenhouse gas target in the future. And we can get pretty close to the 65% recycling rate that, the, that is in the waste framework directive. And importantly, it's worth noting that we've been pretty tough in terms of what we've adjudicated on as being recycled here. We've not taken, we, we've, we've looked at what's actually getting recycled in the facilities, which is, should we say, pretty close to what the EU is now using as its measurement method. So if we go on to the, the, the next slide, just to make this point that um, on the left hand side, you see in the baseline, the weight based uh, recycling and the greenhouse gas uh, recycling rates in that baseline situation. And although by weight, the separate collection system delivers the greatest benefit, it's actually a minority in the uh, greenhouse gas um, performance element, where actually the container parks, the mixed waste sorting and the deposit refund system contribute disproportionately to their weight basis. And that's very important. And it comes back to this point that we need 
holistic system solutions, not just one-shot systems that are uh, one-shot solutions that only deal with part of the problem. So it highlights how how we can actually seize the opportunity I was referring to earlier. This isn't just a theoretical exploration of what might be possible. We can show and demonstrate how people can deliver that opportunity. And that's the intention going forward with Tomra to help demonstrate the practical way forward to deliver and seize that opportunity I was mentioning earlier in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Dr. Hawk, Dr. Raymond, thank you very much for these deep insights. There are several aspects of, this, of, of the waste management problem and we, we will open up the discussion now for your questions. We're waiting for questions coming in and we have the first question. Um, and I will, uh, I, I think that is a question to, to Dr. Raymond first. Are recyclables collected in the general waste in Stavanger and how can the quality for high quality recycling be guaranteed in terms of food grade? Uh, yes, and the, the answer is yes, the recyclables are collected in the general waste in Stavanger. They had a separate system before, but because of the success of the mixed waste sorting, you know, where we quadrupled uh, the amount of plastics that, that we could recover, uh, by now they have stopped the separate uh, collection system uh, for uh, recycling. And when it, when it comes to the quality, you would be amazed how high the quality of the sorted fraction is we get out there. Of course, it depends on a well-designed system. And uh, in, in the past years, we, you know, we have designed several mixed waste sorting uh, plans. And uh, you know, we can only invite you to go there and see the quality of the plastic that we sort out there is very high. Now, when it comes to the question of food grade, Mm -hmm. That is more a question about the type of plastics and about the recycling process, the decontamination uh, process. Because food grade, uh, to make plastics, uh, you know, for food grade, re uh, as recycled material for food grade application, um, is very much determined by the type of plastics you have. For example, PET is a, is a very good plastic, and so is PS. They are quite inert materials, so uh, potential contaminations don't, you know, diffuse into the molecular structure of the plastics. So in the following recycling process, where you have a decontamination process, <coughs> you can make sure that, that, that you get everything out there. Uh, some other materials, it, it is more difficult, uh, like, like, like polyolefins. And it's also a question of, uh, of, of regulations in Europe, the EFSR, you know, is not basically allowing um, uh, for polyolefins at this point in time to use them for food grade applications again. Okay, thank you. I hope that is uh, the answer to the asked question. I'm looking forward to have some more questions coming in. But um, so long I have a question, if I may uh, ask you, if the Stavanga case that you showed to us or shared with us, is that or could that be a role model for other regions? And if so, um, what, what need to be placed or to, to bring in to realize that? Well, what we've tried to do, Claudia, I think it, it's fair to say, is to look at um, uh, places that demonstrate to us elements of best practice. And I think it's fair to say that um, different cases that we've examined do different things really well. But um, what you can definitely say with Stavanger is it's, it's, is it's got the components that we think are probably fairly key to having a really good holistic waste management system. So first of all, and it partly reflects on what Volker was just saying about getting the food grade quality out, and particularly regarding bottles, is that um, there's a very well-performing deposit refund system in place in Norway that deals with the majority of those PET bottles and, uh, and so they are generally available for bottle to bottle recycling. Um, the second thing is that you have separate collection systems that are um, covering some of those key materials like paper, card, um, glass, metals um, and food and garden waste that uh, are, are frankly best kept separately 
um, they get slightly more contaminated if we leave them in uh, residual waste, particularly the organics and the and the paper. So, um, and then uh, the the mixed waste sorting system, we think is going to be increasingly important where uh, countries are looking to meet packaging recycling targets uh, to have, even if there is separate collection in place for the plastics, to have a to have another go at the plastics but potentially saying as the quality of the systems improves, there may well be that argument as in Stavanger for saying, well, do we need to do the separate collection of the plastics if we've already got the PET bottles being dealt with so well through the deposit scheme and if we can take out everything else so well from mixed waste. And so I think uh, those elements are really important in that overall holistic system solution. And what's important then is the, the different, uh, in, in different situations, people are looking to up their performance of each of those elements as we go forward, because nowhere's actually hitting the targets where we'd like people to be uh, at in the very near future. Nobody's actually hitting them today or not, not in the cases that we've seen that there we've is been examining. An... Yeah, thank you. There is an uh, additional question to Stavanger. <coughs> How often is the mixed waste collected per month and at what costs is the question? Can you answer that, Dr. Raymond? Uh, no, sorry, this is uh, very detailed. Um, I, I don't have the answer to that. I'm sure some of our experts uh, know. Uh, we, we have those the, this data. I don't know, Dominic, if that is part of, of, of the study you did. You you probably have also more, more background there, but maybe you also don't have it at hand. But, you know, we, we can, the, I, I think the question is open to somebody, so we, we, we can send you the answer per email. Definitely. Okay. But there is a special question to Tomra. What is, Ray is asking, what is Tomra's long-term view of the RDF and SRF market? So just maybe to, uh, to explain that RDF is refuse derived fuels and, and SRF is shredder residue fraction. Uh, this is basically material, um, very often mixed plastics, but not only plastics um, that, that as of today, there are no good solutions to recycle it, and then they are sent to cement kilns, for example, to burn them as, as, as a replacement of, of coal, uh, for example. And if the question is, what is our long-term view? I think the long-term view from a climate saving perspective is that, you know, we need to decarbonize uh, our, our industry. So, you know, the long-term view is we should not burn fossil fuels anymore. Um, in, in, in the future. And, and at some point in time, you know, don't ask me, you know, when, but at some point in time, you know, we should stop uh, uh, burning uh, fossil fuels um, uh, anymore. Um, and and that, but that is a very long term, uh, term view. These markets will exist for, for a long time. I, I have no doubts about that. Uh, until we have developed good alternative solutions. But this is where the world is currently heavily working on. And there is what we call also a, a recycling hierarchy. Uh, so, so what are the best options in, in terms of uh, greenhouse gas savings? Um, the best option is always mechanical recycling. Um, you, you should always strive for mechanical recycling. That, that, that is basically, you know, sorting the material and remelting it. That, there you save the highest amount of energy and, and consequently uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And then, you know, a, a level lower are what we call new technologies that are now heavily discussed, chemical recycling. And also within chemical recycling, there is a hierarchy. There are solvent-based solutions down to pyrolysis. And uh, these chemical recycling solutions are not as good as the mechanical recycling ones, but they are better than incineration uh, w w when it comes to the overall uh, ecolog ecological footprint. So what, what, what we expect is, or what we are working on, that you know, we also, on, on this recycling hierarchy, we have to work our way up. You know, bringing material up to the, the better, you know, uh, improved step in the recycling value chain. And there's a long way to go uh, because not a lot of material is currently mechanically recycled, but there's a huge opportunity to do much more of that. And this is really actually one of the focus areas we're heavily working on with partners. Okay, thank you very much. Now, 
now uh, many questions are coming in, so I start with the last one. Due to the SUP directive, the single-use plastic, many countries without DRS systems are planning to implement one. Do you think this will add to solving the global waste problem, the deposit re return system? Uh, shall I answer? Yeah. Oh, uh, excuse me. Yeah. I might be fired. One of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, for, for, I, I think, uh, I think it solves a number of problems. I, I think um, uh, the first and foremost is that we have very good evidence of the um, the effect that deposit refund systems have on reducing the littering of the targeted bottles. Where the deposit refund system is well designed and it has and it achieves high return rates. So, and that's the case in Norway and uh, uh, where obviously Stavanger is located in Norway. Um, the second thing is, going back to what we said earlier, um, the in terms of trying to make sure that you are maximizing the the benefit associated with keeping materials uh, in closed loops, maximizing the recycling of, of, of the, the materials. Uh, it's difficult to beat the deposit refund systems um, in terms of the performance they can achieve. Um, finally, there's a sort of more subtle point, and I should have mentioned this in the Stavanger case as well, which is that um, uh, Europe is shifting increasingly away from landfilling residual waste and more and more towards thermal solutions for waste. And many, uh, in many situations, we have municipalities and countries looking to achieve net zero objectives in terms of climate change emissions. And they've started to recognize where, you, where they have incineration plants, as in Denmark and Norway, that actually leaving any plastic in residual waste is a problem because you're then burning fossil carbon in what are often relatively low efficiency energy generating machines, albeit in the Scandinavian countries probably more efficient than in some of the, uh, the other European countries. So you've got this triple win really of reducing uh, the littering of plastics, you are reducing emissions of climate change associated with recycling and potentially jo generating jobs as well, by the way, and uh, and also reducing the emissions associated with the combustion of fossil carbon in the incineration plants. So for all those reasons, I think it's very important. What's going to be really important as well is cascading models of that outside of Europe to the developing world where we know that the, the plastic bottles and the caps are some of the most often found items of plastic on beaches. So we've got to not just do that here, we've got to do it globally. Uh -huh. So thank you very much, Dr. Rehman. You as a pioneer, the next question is for you, I think. From which other countries are there practical examples of the sorting out of high quality recycled PET <laughs> from the residual waste? Yeah, actually, you, you, you find these solutions in, in, in all countries, for example, that don't have deposit systems in place or not even a, a good separate collection of, uh, of plastics. Uh, you, you even find that in emerging countries because there is an informal sector where hand pickers would, would, would really pick the bottles from the street because this one fraction PET bottles has a high value. So actually you find it in a, in a lot of countries that don't have the other systems uh, in place. Because the material is, um, is, for, is that high quality. Exactly. I, I talked in the beginning about the commitments of the big beverage uh, uh, brands. Uh, that that and, and and I have to compliment for them uh, them for that 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 are really increasing step by step the amount of recycled content in their bottles in various countries they are already at 100 percent you know unbelievable you know three four years ago nobody would have thought about that or believed that so this material is sought after this material has a high value higher than virgin material actually um, mm. and and that's why people are picking it up from the streets in uh, in uh, emerging countries. 
Yeah, and that's where systems like the plastic bank idea fits in or um, yeah, looking for solutions. And what is your contribution or your idea to, well, it's the next question, um, to be honest. Are you saying that Tomra can offer solutions on recovery of valuable recyclables, metals, plastics and fiber independent of country or individual country legislation? Uh, let, let's say it like this, this is what we strive for, you know, I, I, I told you that, you know, this is also new to us, we are investing in this, we established this new circular economy division last year, we are now 20 people and, and, and right now we are pure cost center within in, in Tomra, trying to develop those solutions and we have come a long way uh, and, and we will, you know, you will see over time, we will publish more and more of those studies, those results, um, uh, out there and right now we you know we we cannot offer solutions uh, everywhere every country independent of legislation that would be too too much to say but we can offer those solutions in many countries uh, uh, already but it's also clear uh, and i want to be very clear on that you know without any legislative support it will be difficult because as i mentioned earlier the the costs for the for the process of collecting the waste sorting it and, and recycling it there is a cost and you know very often it is higher than using virgin material not always it also depends on the price of virgin material. depends on the oil price uh, for example and uh, without you know the the, um, the wish from society uh, to to use it to go that way uh, and without taking into account the costs of dealing with waste like it's very often done uh, it will not be possible. So a, a legislative support, in our view, is absolutely necessary. The costs need to be, need, need to be covered. And something like uh, extended producer responsibility uh, is, is key to that. Yeah, that's uh, Dr. Hock, maybe you as a consultant for the EU institutions, how um, important from your point of view is um, the EPR idea? Well, it, it, I mean, it's EPR and lots of uh, uh, lots of other things besides. I think it's quite interesting in in the EU. The experience, even in Europe, is that um, we have still something of an implementation gap between um, what uh, EU law would like to see happen and what actually happens on the ground. And often, what we've seen in the past is this sort of um, slightly hopeful belief on the part of uh, legislators that putting something on the statute book in written law will translate into action on the ground. And of course that doesn't happen. So what we've done, and Volk has hinted at this, in, in the holistic system solutions that we've talked about, is yes, we've looked at the system in the, the physical sense, but we have also been looking at and will be proposing, you know, what would what would be what are the key policy drivers that you need to have in place to make this happen? Because, you know, you look at the global waste management situation and there is still a huge amount of uh, waste globally that is being dumped in open in the open uh, or it's being burned or so forth. And so the, um, uh, the, the, if we don't have regulation, policy, law that actually requires the, the system to be changing, then we have a problem. And so um, I, I'd like to give one example, if I may, uh, with, with which I know some of the major brands have committed to removing problematic or unnecessary plastic. Yes, and, but shortly we have another question. Okay, uh, fine. I'll, let, let's skip that then. Okay, Kai is asking, how can raw material suppliers and converters included in the circular economy process without renouncing revenues too much. Of course, of all the suppliers should, of course, of course, all of the suppliers should add to the overall situation, but still they need to survive. Would you recommend that such companies should think about adding recycling divisions at least? Political question. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, you know, I, 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 I cannot decide on the strategies of, of, of those type of companies. But if I were them and, and what we see, I can give you examples of, let's say, the chemical industry. For decades, the chemical industry has had no interest in recycling. 
uh, they they produced their their, their virgin plastics on, onto the market uh, and didn't care so much about the waste problem what what, what happened to it. Uh, but they have also realized they cannot continue like that. It's it's very obvious. And nearly all big chemical companies, and you know these are huge companies we are, we are talking about, are looking into this and are looking into ways and have set up first plans to invest also into the recycling um, industry. Some of them have already, you know, it, it's published. They have acquired some uh, some companies, you know, in small steps trying to understand. But but as a you know producer of uh, virgin plastics. Would it be wrong then, you know, that now that you see that that there is a clear drive towards a towards a closed loop recycling, towards a circular economy, to take a stake in that? I would do so, uh, and 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 you know, there, there's a lot of value that can be uh, generated. So, uh, from from a very high level perspective, whether you take oil as your feedstock material or you take recycled plastics in, as your feedstock material to then produce new type of plastics, either based out of oil or based out of recycled plastics. You know, it's, it's, it's from a you know, high level uh, po point of view, not, not a big difference. Um, the industry behind that, the knowledge required is very different, but from the business model. So I think this could be very interesting and I can see many chemical companies looking into that. Okay. Thank you, um, uh, thank you, Dr. Raymond, Dr. Hawk. With a uh, with a short, very short answer from you both, how optimistic you are at the moment that there is a movement in the right direction on its way, Dr. Hawk? <laughs> I've been doing this for 20 years, so by rights I ought to be quite <laughs> pessimistic. But actually, I'm more optimistic than I've ever been because I see positive signs everywhere. I think the world's waking up to the the huge problem that we have to confront and I sense a, a genuine will now to act and um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of I don't want to put too much on his poor shoulders um, but with the uh, election of the uh, president-elect Joe <laughs> Biden I'm hoping that might be a, a positive sign as well. Good news from America. Yeah, Dr. Yemen? Yeah, I, I can only um, agree to what Dominic has said, and, and from a personal experience, I'm also 25 years now now in this industry, and uh, you know, I, I, I used to say uh, in a very informal way, for 20 years nobody cared so much about what we were doing. You, you know, Tomra is not jumping on this train of sustainability. Tomra was Tomra was built around the idea of sustainability. That that's all we have been doing. You know, for 50 years now, when it comes to re reverse vending machines. Um, but but this time we, we really think it's different. It has never been such a drive towards this. It seems like that at least many parts of the world have you know eventually realized that we cannot continue like, like, like that. And it's probably it's driven by the by the pictures of you know all the plastics in the ocean that that also is visible to every consumer. Social networks you see that. So yes, there there is a clear completely different momentum uh, in the market right now. Okay, thank you very much. Just a few seconds to say thank you for participating to you all and your contribution. Thank you for your time. Stay safe and take care. Goodbye and have a good day.